Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking time off your busy schedule to join us today in this very exciting panel discussion on law and technology. With us here today is an esteemed industry expert who are equally passionate about the intersection of law and technology. I'm Jingjie, Head of CYS Legal Affairs and moderator for today's panel discussion. So it's not an exaggeration to say that emerging technologies like generative AI, D5, blockchain and Web3 have taken the world by storm and supercharged global discourse on ethics, governance and regulation. Beyond regulating AI systems, governments, policymakers, regulators, practitioners and even academics are also now confronting broader questions about the impact of technology on society at large, such as the impact of AI on jobs, inequality, societal trust and geopolitical rivalry. Yet, how much about emerging technology, especially generative AI, is truly game-changing? And how much is just noise and fluff? Are our legal systems and regulatory frameworks still relevant today? Is an incremental approach to regulating AI systems appropriate? Or is wholesale change needed? Without further ado, let me introduce the panelists for today. First, we have Madam Rahayu. Madam Rahayu is currently the Senior Parliamentary Secretary at the Ministry of Health and Law after serving her time at the Ministry of Communication and Information, MCI. She was previously a lawyer by profession, specialising in civil litigation and family law. We have Mr. Yong Si Kin, who is presently the Chief Executive at SAL, Singapore Academy of Law. Concurrently, he's also the assist Assistant Chief Executive at IMDA. His scope of work includes developing forward-thinking governance on AI and data, driving a pipeline of AI talent, and promoting industry adoption of AI and data analytics. Zikin spearheaded the development of Singapore's model AI governance framework and is currently a member of the OECD network of experts on AI. Next up, we have Mr. Rakesh. Rakesh leads the Dispute Resolution and Information Technology Practice and serves as Chief Technology Officer at Drew and Napier, LLC. He is also our Honorary Legal Counsel here at CYS. He has represented clients in complex arbitration and litigation matters in a broad range of industries including technology, life sciences and engineering. Last but not least, we have Prof Lee. Prof Lee is currently the Dean and Professor at Yong Pang Hao School of Law she was previously the Vice Provost of SMU, where she oversaw the, re the review and development of the university's academic governance policies. Prof Lee teaches corporate law, but her research interest encompasses company, private, technology, and commercial law. The time when I was in law school and when I was in practice, we were still stamping page numbers on bundles of documents, and that's a very foreign thing today. Um, but that was the generation I was from. We've seen the developments and I'm also now in Ministry of Law where we cover civil and legislative developments, criminal law, IP, international law. And in all the segments that we are looking at, community law and all that, we are seeing the impact of technology in the work that we do. And so I think it is a very apt moment to take time to Think about that, how it's impacting the profession, how it's impacting the way we work, as well as how it's impacting the community in terms of access to justice, as well as the use of legal services. Uh, uh, SPS mentioned uh, we used to have to stamp uh, page numbers. Yeah, I kind of uh, digitized that. So we introduced a script that allows you to add a page number into every page of the PDF documents, so you don't have to stamp it anymore. But it's still just digitizing. <laughs> uh, and uh, as the bio um, that was read out earlier uh, mentioned, um, I am also into uh, AI, uh, responsible AI, so uh, fully behind the work that Singapore does in um, ethics and governance for AI, and very recently, for generative AI as mm. well. Like some of you, uh, when I was younger, I used to build computers, I used to build applications, I used to code web pages for um, NUS when I was studying there, you know, things like that. And when I got into practice, I realized that uh, there's this gap in the legal profession where a number of lawyers, not just senior lawyers, but even uh, mid to, uh, junior to mid lawyers, um, they weren't very tech savvy. They, they, they understood the law, they were excellent lawyers, they were excellent advocates. Um, 
but they didn't really quite understand uh, how technology worked, how technology could help them and benefit them in the practice of law. I started in, uh, proposing and introducing uh, software applications, uh, hardware that could improve workflow at Druid Apia, uh, and I think it was quite gratefully adopted by the management at the time. Uh, and let's just say that I can take some credit for us being a little bit more efficient, right? The other area where I think uh, I, I've seen um, my tech skills benefit me is really uh, when it comes to uh, legal practice and, and, and how the law affects uh, technology and also how the techno technology affects the development of the law. So all of us uh, who are asp aspiring lawyers in this room, um, we all want to be good lawyers, right? And so we have to appreciate that as the world grows, as we progress with technological development, you need to have literacy. Literacy over how technology works, how code works, how enterprise IT works, so that when a client comes to you with a tech problem, you're able to understand that tech problem. And in fact, in many cases, you may end up explaining the tech issue and the legal issue to the client at that time. In my current role um, as a faculty member and of course as Dean of the Law School, I've been thinking a lot about the future, right? The future of the profession and how we as educators have the responsibility of preparing our students for a future that is very rapidly evolving, a future that is filled with uncertainty and it's very volatile. So it's very challenging uh, to be in my shoes and, and those of my colleagues because we have to grapple with a lot of unknowns. Um, but it's also, um, it's, it's, also, it's also very exciting because there are many opportunities. Uh, if you um, would have read today's news, I, I forget which publication it was, but there have been two New York lawyers who have recently been sanctioned by a New York federal judge for using ChatGPT to draft their submissions. Um, in, in a case where ChatGPT completely fabricated certain cases, right? And the fabrications looked so realistic, right, that even the judge um, believed it for a while until opposing counsel enlightened everyone and said, actually, we've checked the citations and no such cases exist. And to me, that is actually uh, the most important issue that generative AI has brought to the fore when it comes to the legal profession ethics, right? We have to be very, very careful about how we use generative AI and then um, we must remember we can use it as a tool because it helps us speed up our work, it helps us become more efficient, but to rely on it completely and to remove the veil of verification that every single one of us should have because let's face it, we're all accountable for ourselves. It is never an excuse to blame the technology. You can't go to a judge and say, I'm so sorry, ChatGPT told me that this was true. But ChatGPT is not the lawyer here. You are, right? And so you have to make sure that you check every single word that you use in your submissions in any document that you file in court. That's one of the more critical issues. And of course, there are other issues which arise. Like for example, um, if I can use the um, uh, very famous uh, legal concept of defamation. <clears throat> if you defame someone, you're intending to defame someone. What happens if um, you ask ChatGPT a question and it spits out an answer that is false and in the process of that actually defames someone potentially famous? Mind you, this is a real case, right? And in that instance, who is actually responsible for the defamation? Is it the person who asked the question? Is it ChatGPT? How can that be? Or is it the developer of ChatGPT? Because they were the one who put the algorithm together and trained it. These questions are now becoming um, very, very interesting and, and they're being brought to the fore again because of the unique nature of ChatGPT. It's a very exciting time, right? It is, I think, the first time where we're dealing with technology that is, you could say, perceived to be undeterministic. At least with blockchain, you know the smart contract is if this, then that, you know what's gonna happen. But now with ChatGPT, the perception that it gives everyone is that it's actually intelligent, but we need to remember it's also artificial. I think 
this is where we really get into the thick of things, yeah. very interesting um, issues. Uh, Rakesh alluded to some of the um, issues that might arise. Mm -hmm. Key thing is false responses or hallucinations because it is artificial after all. And we've known of cases where it's concocted something that's false and actually makes it very, very difficult for the person who has been impacted by it to unravel that. Because as we know, that coupled with the uh, pervasiveness of online travel of information and news and misinformation, it really makes it very, very challenging. Also because there are really inherent issues of inheriting biases, because where do you use um, AI? Sometimes in trying to um, sieve out some um, specific traits or characteristics of people and if let's say it's being used within an employment context, you then inherit the biases and then there are concerns and considerations about the ethical uh, nature of that. So these are some of the issues that we have to appreciate because we're going to see this um, being manifested in many different forms because generative AI has a lot of potential. It can be used in school, right? You can actually use it to um, curate a study, um, to actually um, curate and tailor make um, the absorption of knowledge towards that, that person's needs. But there are dangers to that, right? If you yeah. don't do this, use it right. You can use it at workplaces um, to get the first draft out, you know. But if you're so enamored by it and then you don't go and double check, you end up putting up false information out there as pieces of your work. You can use it at workplaces and as, as I've mentioned, you know, for you to maybe pick up <coughs> suitable candidates for certain jobs. But if it's not fed the right information, then there'll be issues to that as well. Yep. So these are some of the inherent challenges that exist. And I think in particular with legal issues, there are confidentiality issues, which probably Zakin can touch on later also. Because you put in training data into AI to generate information. It repeats it and there needs to be protection in place. Um, otherwise, you know, there'll be dangers also to be concerned about. There are issues of copyright because the original data from which it draws from, you know, may not be attributed. And then you continue to um, develop something. So who has IP rights? Exactly. And, and these are things and questions that I think we need to probably unpack. Um, having said that though, I wouldn't want us to go away thinking that, oh, it's just so difficult, so dangerous and hence something we should um, run away from. And actually to the contrary, right? The whole point of us being here is to try and unpack this issue and to try to see how there can be solutions, meaningful ones, to overcome this, still leverage on the benefits of AI, but yet be aware of its potential dangers because of its inherent nature. And that's very much part of the work we do at the Ministry of Law as well, to, and, and the government really, because we need to meaningfully figure out a way where we can regulate perhaps, where we can um, put this in a certain platform or infrastructure, where we can generate its benefits while protecting people from its inherent dangers. And I think this is something that we have to do together. And um, I love it that Rakesh said you're the future because this is really your future we're talking about. And I think the solutions have to come from the community as well. So I hope conversations and platforms like this allow for us to generate thoughts and ideas on these matters. So for, for an area like um, generative AI, maybe I use three, um, three characteristics to try and illustrate what, what we do. I think the first one is, um, is AI, right? So uh, it is uh, probabilistic in nature, right? So uh, what, what, do you, what do you mean by probabilistic? It basically means that if I have more data that says A and less data that says B, the AI is going to be more likely to predict A rather than B, right? So, uh, so uh, generative AI essentially works that way. Um, uh, Madam Rahayu has lots of information about her on the internet, right? Because she's well known, right? And if you ask ChatGPT, because there's more information about her, it's more likely to get information correct, right? Because it's just more of that, right? Uh, I'm less than known, right? So uh, my friend has actually uh, run uh, ChatGPT, uh, asked ChatGPT, who is Yong Zikin? And uh, I have turned out to be a public health officer who was very active during the pandemic, which is totally, totally untrue, right? Yeah. But this is an illustration of how the technology works. Because, because it depends on information that's available to train 
and it is essentially predicting the next word followed by the next word and the next word, right? So if you have less information, you're going to get it more likely to get it wrong. If you have more information, you're going to more likely to get it right. And this is one principle that we need to understand in order to have our policies in place. If you treat every piece of uh, material you find online to be the same, it means that an article from the Straits Times is equally uh, has the same uh, weight and relevance as a page on hardware.com, hardware zone, right? And a page on, um, I don't know, uh, Reddit. Uh, Reddit, right? Yeah. But what happens? You, you, you then end up with a situation where you have more information which is not of good quality le uh, and less instances of information of good quality, right? So this is one of the things that we do. We need to understand this. And then, right, how do we promote the right use of this technology? We basically say that be very careful about the source of information that you take when you're training your models, because you can control that, right? So don't use uh, unverified information to train your models. Be sure to point your models to the right source of information so that you get something <coughs> like this correct, right? So this is just one example of what, uh, of what we do. We promote this kind of positive um, uh, behavior through our model framework, uh, but, but first understanding how the technology works, how it is developed and how it is used, right? And then uh, using policies to nudge us uh, in the right directions. Essentially, the, uh, what, the uh, what it does is to say that if you um, have got good practices, you've selected your data well, and you've gone through your training um, uh, well, you've made your selection well, you've tested it, it is sufficiently explainable, repeatable, right, and, and uh, reproducible, then how can, how can you get the assurance that you have done the right thing, right? Uh, so basically, what AI Verify does is that it is a tool. It's a tool that companies can download, and it can you, they can run that tool against the model that they have trained. So it is an independent test of the model. And what the tool does is it provides the results, mm -hmm. right? It tests for bias, it tests for exp explainability, it tests for robustness, and it, it gives a record of everything else you do, right? But it gives you an independent view, an independent um, uh, report. Right. Uh, as a responsible uh, company or a responsible developer, you then decide, is the report telling you things that you are comfortable with? Mm. Does it point out issues that you want to fix before you deploy your model? Are you happy with the result? Very quickly, we came to the conclusion that we cannot ban it. Uh, we, we receive news from, you know, we hear about you, uh, Australian universities trying to ban it, but this is just not impossible. You know, the common sense is that you can't impose a rule that you cannot enforce. Right? What's the point of banning it when you, there's no way you can police whether your students will be using it? But the more important um, consideration is that we don't want to stop our students from embracing um, AI. We don't want to stop them from uh, learning about the technology and using it. And so our conclusion is that we should allow it. We even actually encourage it in some ways because some of my colleagues then started incorporating chat GPT into their classes. So they have assignments where they ask the students uh, specifically that you can use chat GPT to help you um, uh, discover a solution to this problem and then you critique the answer that mm. ChatGPT produces. Got it. So, so some of my colleagues have started doing that, and even in our introductory legal legal writing courses, we already incorporate some of these exercises to demonstrate the limits of technology. I think that's a very important um, in, in for, important consideration that as we embrace technology, the the human the human partner must understand the limits of the technology and then respond to it appropriately. So that, that makes us still the master and not merely the servant of the technology. Typically, whenever uh, I interview a potential candidate you know, to hire, 
Um, I will ask them whether or not they have any tech skills, you know, whether they've coded before, whether they have, uh, you know, kind of like myself, built to build their own computer. Um, do they understand what certain terms means, you know? Um, more, more often than not, uh, if I do find someone who understands exactly what I'm talking about, it just means they're speaking the same language as me, right? And when they are speaking the same language as me, I know that they will be able to speak the same language uh, to the clients that I service and also to the, um, the clients' IT departments. Because typically, remember, um, it's not just um, uh, uh, lawyers who are sometimes a little bit tech adverse. Even business folk, the layman in the street, sometimes they can also be quite tech adverse. So if you have the ability to not just understand uh, technology, but also to, lack of, for lack of a better term, translate it into easy terms, simple terms to understand um, to business folk, to clients, you will find that your value in the legal profession skyrockets. Because that's what really, that's really what clients want. If you can understand the terms that people use, if you can sit down with uh, someone from IT and they can explain their problem to you in words that they understand and you can understand that, you can equally translate that into legal issues for the in-house counsel, for example, or the general counsel. So these are things that I find to be very useful. Now, having said that, do not be afraid if you don't code or if you've never built your own computer or things like that, right? The most important attribute that you must have is curiosity. As long as you are curious about these things, as long as you are willing to get on the internet, right, do a web search, understand how uh, code may work, understand how enterprise IT works, you've already won half your battle, okay? So don't be afraid of that. It's the more important issue is make sure that you always stay curious and stay hungry. Right? And then, um, as you deal with uh, issues in legal practice, it's not just technology, by the way, it's any area of practice, whether it's finance, banking, intellectual property, you won't know everything. But if you're curious about everything, you'll have the ability to find out. So that, I would say, is the most important. Um, SMU Law has um, law and um, tech uh, programs that are specializations or joint degree programs, and I think these are important things. What I would really encourage students to do is really go beyond schools also. It's good that many of you are here in this platform, and actually that, that really reflects on the curiosity that um, Rakesh spoke about. You need to be curious because these things go faster than whatever Definitely. anyone can prepare for at a very um, structured level. Yeah. So go learn outside school. But learning also doesn't stop at school, and um, that's why there's no fear because information is out there. A lot of open source information available. In particular for the legal sector, that's also a job of the ministry to see that we are really focusing on continuing legal education, on um, professional development. Clearly then technology and AI has to be part of that um, um, development, right? Um, there is a committee uh, for professional training that has been set up several years back and some aspects of it are important in terms of making sure that we are preparing lawyers for that. When you mentioned um, the speech by CJ Sundresh Menon yeah. at the Law and Business Symposium in Paris, it is a must read and it is, I think, quite instructive as to the future of law and technology in terms of that marriage. It's not just technology augmenting the legal practice, but also law um, that will evolve because of technology and also suggestions as to how we move forward with it. And there was a sense of urgency, I think, that was planted in it. Um, and I, I felt that it's something that will be useful for us as we move forward. Um, I think both Zeki and Rakesh were also there um, listening to the speech and we all got quite excited about it. So I, it's a must read. I would recommend that you take a look at it. Yeah, so I, I think we, we need to grapple with, um, we need to begin by recognizing that a major shifts in the industry. So the kind of work that lawyers are going to do will change dramatically. Um, the work that a lot of junior lawyers used to do, will some of it will disappear, maybe a lot of it will disappear. And the idea of lawyering is changing. You know, when you watch these um, dramas on TV, you, you tend to still think of the paradigm of lawyers who argue in court. But that paradigm is actually fast, um, uh, uh, fading away because a lot of the work that 
lawyers are trained to do eventually in the future will go beyond advocacy in the courtroom, will go even beyond transactional work. There will be a lot of compliance, regulatory work, advisory work, um, and even work in startups and so on. So the roles of lawyers actually are going to expand dramatically. Don't, don't come to law school if you're thinking of coming to law school with a set idea of what lawyering is. Now, so how do we prepare our students for that kind of a future? Stop coming to university to think that if you do a degree, you are set for life in a certain career. It's not going to happen anymore. Right? You do a degree, it gives you some basic knowledge in certain area, but you will have to build on it and then carve out your own career. There's a lot of self-mastery in this process. So learning to learn is one of the key traits that we want to inculcate in our students. Uh, a major route to that really is um, interdisciplinary studies. So in SMU, our DNA really is to introduce students to uh, different disciplines right from the start. Even if you're a law student, we are gradually introducing quite a lot of tech-related causes, digital intelligence and so on, um, to give our students exposure. And they are going to do an internship in uh, different organizations. Now, one of our major initiatives was to set up the law and computing program. Now, that program doesn't train lawyers per se, but we train engineers who are interested in the law. So these are a new crop of talents who will be able to um, um, think about law from, from an engineering design perspective. So that will again help to propel changes in the legal industry. Now, one of the interesting things we observe as a result of that is that our law students are now interacting with our computing and law students and they're working together. And this is one of the things that we want to happen, that our students work with people from different disciplines to solve problems so that they know that the solutions don't lie in just a particular discipline. Perhaps the last point I just want to make is that the change is, must go beyond just teaching some new causes. The change must be a change of the whole ecosystem. Students must come to university and then realize that that is a whole culture where tech is embedded in their education. It's something that they, they eat and breathe and live, you know, like it's normal part of life. It's like how we all learn mathematics and nobody thinks that learning mathematics is special. No, so, so tech must become that sort of that part of our, edu our education where it becomes natural to us. So that's the environment that we are trying to create in, in SMU. We are actually building our um, career and education counselling programmes within the schools. I think in every school now, there are very strong um, counsellors that are available. If they don't have the information, they should be able to channel you to the right direction. This is specifically if you're looking at it as careers. So that's one, one option for you to go over and have conversations with them. Two, I think we can encourage and speak to some schools to actually do some of these programs in school, make it a bit more um, accessible to students. But three, actually within the community, there are a lot of volunteers now who actually come out with programs that are done in the heartlands. So even if you don't have it in schools, you can always sign up to some of these programs at your CCs and everywhere else. It's that curiosity and that, uh, that spirit to, to just knock on doors and try, right? And, uh, and, and I think if there's anything that we could start any time in your life, it's really that curiosity. And just ask, go and ask. That, uh, in a lot of uh, schools to today, uh, there are programs uh, for coding, IT clubs you can join. It's not part of the main curriculum, but exercise that new curiosity. Ask around, find out, and go, right? And for when you want to intern, right, it's the same thing as well. There are, uh, there are pro uh, a lot of these big tech um, uh, companies. They have internship. You need to. You can ask around. Uh, there, are, there are place. There are people you can approach and find out, and um, ask friends of friends. Right. Uh, that's the kind of attitude that will help you get in through the door. How do you get the best of that experience? Again, right. Ask. Come to the room of your mentor. Right. Ask him for half an hour and say, uh, hey, I've got questions to ask you. 
uh, I'm very free. Give me some things to do, right? <laughs> yeah. 